I call the meeting of the San Juan Unified Board of Education to order. There is one closed session item on tonight's agenda. Collective bargaining matters discussion with negotiator Daniel Thigpen, Executive Director, Labor Relations and Government Affairs regarding CSEA Chapter 127, General Operating Support, Chauffeurs, Teamsters, Local, num local Number 150, Transportation, Supervisors, Teachers and Certificated Supervisory Units, and regarding non-represented groups, Management and Confidential Units, Government Code Section 54957.6. We do not have we do not have any speaker cards on the closed session agenda items. We will now move into closed session and we'll return to open session at 6:30 p.m. Call the meeting of the San Juan Unified Board of Education back to order. The meeting is being audio and video recorded, and the recording may capture sounds and images of those attending this meeting. The recording will be posted on the district's website. Board meetings are being held in person in the boardroom at the district office and the community is welcome to attend. The meeting may also be viewed on the district's YouTube channel where it is being live streamed. Please stand for the presentation of the colors by the Casa Roble Fundamental High School Air Force Junior ROTC. Vote. Ready. Case. Case form color guard. Ready. Case present colors. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. Order. Arms. Ready. Case. Forward. Perch. Good evening and welcome. I'm Zima Creason, board president. To my left is Ms. Pam Costa, board vice president. To her left is Mr. Steve Miller, board clerk. And to his left is Mr. Ben Avey and Ms. Tanya Krevchek. And Mr. Saul Hernandez, board members. To my right is Superintendent Melissa Bassanelli. And to her right is board administrative assistant, mm -hmm. Stephanie Cunningham. Board member Paula Viesquez is absent tonight due to medical reasons. And a little bit more on that, Ms. Viesquez met, uh, br uh, brought her new baby home on New Year's Day. Uh, her new baby's name is Lucia Elena, and she was born on June, uh, January 1st at 6.10 a.m., weighing in at 6 pounds and 15 ounces, and she's 19 inches long. Mom and baby and dad are doing great. So we wish her all the best. Um, in other news, I'm excited to welcome our new superintendent to the diet. Welcome, Superintendent I also want to take a moment to extend a sincere, a sincere thanks to our immediate past superintendent, Kent Kern, for his years and years of service. I don't believe Kent is here today because why should he be? Uh, but I still would like to give him a round of applause. So when he uh, watches the recording, we know he knows that we give him some love. <laughs> Individuals uh, who are attending this meeting in person and would like to offer a public comment, we ask that you complete a speaker request card available at the staff table and you will be called on at the appropriate time during the agenda. Please note that board bylaw 9323 limits visitor comment to two minutes per speaker with no more than 30 minutes per single topic. 
Time will be extended for any speaker who uses an interpreter. Please note that public comments, including your name, become part of the public record. We are now on item D, approval of the minutes. Are there any corrections to the minutes? Being none, is there a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. In a second? Second. It has been moved by Ms. Costa, seconded by Mr. Avey. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes 6-0. We are at item E1, high school student council reports. Tonight, we will hear from student representatives from Rio Americano High School and San Juan High School. Well, uh, let's welcome and let's begin with Tanner Schindley and Lainey Shada. Did I get it right? <laughs> From Rio Americano. Good evening, President Creason, members of the board, Superintendent Bassinelli, and Ms. Cunningham. My name is Tanner Schindley. And I am Lainey Shada. We are here tonight representing Rio Americano High School. Rio has had a fantastic first semester. Um, earlier this semester, we held our annual homecoming dance with over 1,300 students, making it Rio's most successful dance yet. We are also incredibly proud of our sports teams, including the boys basketball team for winning the Jack Scott basketball tournament in December, and we wish them luck tonight as they beat the El Camino Eagles. Uh, we are also <laughs> proud of two of our tennis players, Malia Simmons and Gina Garrity, who made it to the CIF singles semifinals, meaning two out of the four girls for the Northern California Tennis Championships were from Rio Americano. These are just two highlights of the amazing sports taking place on campus. So congratulations to all of our athletes um, for the first semester, and we are excited to see the accomplishments of next semester. This um, semester, we held three rallies focused on improving campus culture and highlighting several of the programs on Rio's campus, some of which include band, readers theater, and participants from every sports. We are looking forward to hosting two more rallies this semester as we continue to improve our campus culture and highlight the importance of campus diversity. Through different senior projects of our Civitas program, we have raised over $15,000 for various causes and organizations, including breast cancer awareness, youth experiences, and more. With more than half of our senior projects still remaining, we are excited to see our campus come together to support these important causes and use our platforms in, as students to make an impact in our community. Additionally, this semester, Rio became one of the first schools in the San Juan Unified District to hold a fentanyl awareness assembly. Coordinated by PTSA, this assembly was able to provide Rio students with helpful information on drug safety and bring awareness to the dangers of fentanyl. Um, some other things we are looking forward to this upcoming semester include our three dances, Spring Fling, Junior Prom, and Senior Ball. The proceeds from these events will go to supporting graduation and other school-wide events and activities. We are also extremely excited to be hosting an after-school carnival at Rio, uh, where we are inviting the whole community to get involved. This event will be on March 24th, and we invite all of you to join us and be a part of the Rio community. Thank you for having us here tonight. And if you have any questions, we would be happy to answer them at this time. Thank you for your report. Any questions or comments from the board? Ms. Grevchak. I don't have any questions. I just wanted to say that I am so impressed with your public speaking. You both are so at ease and comfortable up there and it public speaking is part of so many professions and is just so helpful in life. So kudos to you and keep it up. Thank, Thank you. you. I had the same comments for uh, Tanner and Laney. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Well, as always, I appreciate you and your time and um, good luck on your basketball game. <laughs> <laughs> I will say too, um, I was I did hear about your fentanyl awareness event and I know that it did come to El Camino after your event. So I was able to hear from my student a little bit about the experience and the lived experience that the mother brought to the table and how just impactful um, and real that it was. So, um, so glad. I, it's my understanding that it was a parent from Rio that, you know, got the district plugged in is my understanding. So I'm really thankful that yeah. we're having those hard conversations um, because we want you to be safe. We want our community to be safe. So wonderful presentation and thank you for joining us tonight. Thank, thank you. you. And next, we will hear from Drew Hansen and Zubin Tagori from San Juan High. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, good evening, President Creason, members of the board, uh, Superintendent Bassanelli, and Miss Cunningham. My name is Zubin Tagore. And my name is uh, and my and and I am and I am the Drew Henson from um, from um, Salem High School. Welcome. Yeah. Okay. So, thank you so much for uh, thank you so much for uh, for inviting us to share all the great things we have had going on at Salem High School. Here. Are, here, okay. So here are some of the details of activities we have, we have had since our last since since our last um, presentation. Uh, last fall, we had trunk or treat organized by our ELD students celebrating uh, Dia de los Muertos. Uh, students and staff brought their cars into Spartan Circle, decorated them, and then there was a vote for the best design. Um, ofrendas were created and contributed to by various members of the school to honor those who have passed. Uh, this was a wonderful day for all in the Spartan family. So, as like us, a murder mystery performed by our drama club was a uh, was a was a was a was a um, a, um, a um, smashing success. Um, the theater was alive, and the audience got involved in the Who Done It thriller. Um, um, our first homecoming dance in years. The rally, game, and dance were were um, were um, um, well well done. Um, okay, so, um, the rally featured a rap battle between four teachers and a and so between uh, between um, four teachers and uh, and um, I, and our VP Miss Belt. We the students were the real winners of those of those um, performances. <laughs> um, there was a chili cook-off in our culinary CTE pathway amongst the senior members of the class. Uh, Ms. Belt, Mr. Walters, and Ms. Cox had the difficult task of being the judges. All the unique chilies were delicious, but in the end, the vegan submission won the battle of the flavors. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> our winter sports are in full swing. Girls varsity basketball, uh, um, 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 boys varsity basketball, JV boys JV boys basketball, wrestling, and both boys and girls soccer. I myself, I myself am am um, included in wrestling. Wrestling so far has been a huge, um, huge, uh, huge, um, huge uh, success. And and for um, tomorrow, we have our first live meet match. Um, we are uh, looking forward to continuing the all league games. Um, student government will be putting on its second dance of the school year, the upcoming winter ball on January 28th. Uh, we're excited to take what we learned from homecoming and make this dance even better. Uh, sophomore Spartan Up Day is coming. Uh, Spartan Up Day will Spartan Up Day will be a special day to inspire, support, and motivate our Spartan sophomores on January 26th. This idea is the brainchild of our uh, intervention teacher, Miss Key. Uh, she noticed that every year the sophomores seem to be in a slump and need something to motivate and support them. A committee of our entire wellness team has planned for the event, and we hope the outcome will be the sophomores passing all of their classes this semester and being motivated to continue and excel in the rest of their years at San Juan High. Uh, Denisha Bland from Sacramento Area Youth Speaks, uh, aka says, is doing an art residency with the Restorative Justice class and the freshman wellness class says is a social justice movement that empowers youth and transforms education by creating platforms for critical literacy, access to higher education, youth voice, and civic engagement. Says elevates the voice of students as the authors of their own lives and agents of change. San Juan students are benefiting greatly from this partnership. Um, one of the biggest uh, one of the biggest achievements I think San Juan has had this year is the reinstitution of Spartan Time. Uh, Spartan Time uses our rally bell schedule, but instead of a rally, uh, students go to class that they need the most help in to be academically successful. Um, so, like for example, if I um, there's like a one hour block of time, and if I need help in in math specifically, then I can get um, focused help during that hour. Um, the freshman teachers have been doing this for the uh, doing this a few of these last semester, but our ELAC committee and leadership team believed it would be uh, a benefit all students of all grade levels. Teachers discussed the idea and agreed to bring it back. 
We had two Spartan time days leading up to the end of the semester, and due to its success, we'll be bringing it back in the spring. I can say from my personal experience, it's an incredibly effective way to support students and academics or students that just need a break if they're already caught up in their classes. Um, I believe it's something that should be shared with the district and our fellow high schools, as I've heard only positive feedback from my peers. Um, thank you so much again for, um, um, thank you so much again for um, inviting us this, this evening to speak about the Ankara events happening, happening at um, Sound High School. Any questions? Do any board members have questions or comments? Mr. Hernandez. I just wanted to thank you for your report and especially the report on the Spartan Days. That sounds like an incredible idea that's, that uh, people are buying into and benefiting also. Thank you so much. And Mr. Mm -hmm. Hanson, we wish you the very good luck tomorrow in your first match. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Amy. Um, kind of loud. Um, no, I agree. The Spartan time, that is just a great idea. And I do hope that's a, I don't know, maybe a best practice that other schools can learn from. But I also just want to say, um, with San Juan Rio Americano, I mean, rap battles, school rivalries, <laughs> chili cook-offs, although I want to recount on the vegan chili. <laughs> um, you know, dances, I think these are, it's so good to hear about them. Um, I think we we took those activities for granted, and I think it's so nice to see them coming back so strong um, with all of the the students participating in it. So it's just great to have it back. And thank you so much for a lot of the work around that because I know a lot of that falls to student leaders to make those things happen. So thank you to all of you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for the report. It was fabulous. And I have a couple of notes. Um, as a pescatarian, yeah, keep bringing on that vegan chili. I wish that I got an invite to that. That's awesome. Um, spies like us. I just have to say, I didn't even know that that was, I didn't even know what that was until my husband recently made me watch it um, with Dan Aykroyd. And then I saw that you guys were putting on the play. I'm like, people actually know about this movie. So I wish that I went to that play. I bet it was amazing. When I watched it, it was hilarious. Um, so I think it's really cool that you guys did the rest of the play. I didn't even know it was a thing. Um, the wellness for sophomores, that really touched my heart that there was a recognition of a specific group, you know, because of course it's great to have very broad overarching programming and services and supports for our community. But it really touches my heart when we notice that someone needs something different, you know, a sector of our community, because one size doesn't always fit all. And what can we do to go above and beyond um, to make sure everyone's getting what they need? So that's fabulous. And thank you for sharing that. And again, the Spartan time showing up and getting what you need in the moment, you know, because that could change day to day. That's a wonderful opportunity. So thank you for the wonderful report. Um, stay safe, all of you um, getting back home. I don't know if the storms came back yet. Thank you. Well, all. Thank you. Great job. All right. And so again, thanks so much for your report. Student voice is incredibly important to the board and we very much appreciate you taking the time to join us tonight. Thanks again. We are now at item E2, staff reports. Tonight we have two staff reports. Let's begin with Mr. Camarda and Mr. Bross. Thank you and good evening, uh, President Kreese and uh, members of the board, Superintendent Bassanelli and Ms. Cunningham. I'm gonna do two things tonight. I would like to first recognize the effort of our support teams in getting prepared to open due to the winter storms. And then I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Director, uh, Mr. Colin Bross to share a little bit more detailed uh, information and, and our status and give you a status update as well. So first thing I'd like to say is uh, I wanna point out that um, our operations team worked in some of the nastiest uh, weather conditions that we've had in a very long time. They were out there in the wind, in the rain, uh, you know, cutting down trees and clearing debris from storm drains and uh, just out there doing uh, yeoman's work and making sure that uh, we can get our, our school safely opened uh, for Tuesday. So I want to, um, I want to uh, just recognize their efforts for that. Uh, we're going to continue those efforts. We're not done. There's a lot of debris still on our campuses. We just moved it aside of what we could so we can get open. Uh, so for the next couple weeks, uh, we'll be continuing this work. And uh, we'll also be um, out there just uh, uh, cleaning up what's going to occur potentially for tonight and the storms that are that are uh, that are that are behind the ones that already come up. Uh, I'd also I'd like to uh, publicly recognize uh, multiple departments, uh, departments, if you bear with me. I'd like to uh, recognize and thank our maintenance and operations division, uh, custodial, 
uh, facilities, nutrition services, technology, transportation, facility business services, uh, and our communications team. Uh, it, was a, it was a huge lift to ensure that we could open safely, uh, open up uh, with clean and uh, free from uh, debris and downed trees, uh, free from flooding, uh, free from roof leaks, uh, and our plumbing and electrical systems and our impossible infrastructure uh, was up and running uh, prior to Tuesday, with the exception of a couple of uh, two sites that had some issues uh, with SMUD getting them back up and running. Uh, Grand Oaks is now up and running and we're awaiting uh, some resolution to Barrett's power situation. Uh, upon return, uh, our students had meals. Uh, they had meals despite the fact that we lost a lot of product uh, due to the prolonged uh, power outages in our, refrigera in our refrigeration. Uh, Snay and her team uh, worked very quickly, uh, got new product in and was able to serve uh, quite a bit of meals, uh, uh, not only breakfast, uh, but lunch and was also to provide meals to the two schools that uh, did not have power. So we appreciate Snay and her team uh, for doing that. Uh, our transportation uh, buses are ran today. Uh, so they did a great job in uh, organizing routes, getting folks in and getting to the schools. And there was some, a few diversions they've had to make uh, with some of our city streets, but uh, uh, they made it happen. So I appreciate the transportation department. Uh, also our uh, technology department, uh, we had uh, connectivity on all of our sites, except for the three that had power outages. Uh, so I'd appreciate uh, the work that our technology uh, department did to make sure that we uh, were connected uh, for uh, teaching and learning uh, to occur today. Uh, so again, I'd like to thank uh, all those divisions uh, for their hard work and their dedication to the staff and the students. I'd also like to take this opportunity to uh, thank the various public agencies that we work with, uh, Sacramento County, uh, was out there clearing the roads, the debris, clearing floods. Uh, so we appreciate Sac County very much. Uh, we also uh, appreciate SMUD. I mean, there was gentlemen and uh, ladies and gentlemen that are out there, uh, you know, around the clock, uh, working in some pretty nasty conditions, getting the power up not only for our schools, uh, but for all of our businesses and our families that, uh, that we serve in the 75 square miles here and beyond. Uh, we only think about our particular area, but sm SMUD, uh, care, uh, uh, carries a very large uh, footprint. So we, we appreciate SMUD uh, very much. Uh, we also would like to thank our uh, business partners and primarily West Coast Arborist. Uh, they came out and assisted us uh, with some of the very large trees and some of the, and some of the trees that we were sus uh, suspect uh, that potentially could fall uh, because they started uprooting. So we appreciate their efforts and along with our teams in getting all that debris removed. Um, we, uh, we also provided, um, uh, our custodial division went out and did some uh, pretty heavy assessments on Sunday night. So we woke the, we, we uh, quickly scrambled on Sunday. We felt it was important uh, to get our teams up and out uh, to we, so we can make assessments of all the damage and then come up with a plan, use all day Monday for us to be able to, to, to uh, uh, figure out all these tasks and get all these plans executed and everything done and clean and safe. Uh, they did a fantastic job reporting back uh, so Mr. Bross and his teams can uh, uh, organize the, uh, the work to be done. Uh, lastly, I'd like to uh, thank our cabinet leadership for their guidance, uh, Superintendent Bassanelli, our cabinet, uh, for their guidance and also for their patience. Uh, they want to have information very quickly. They want to share that information, but it's a very large effort when you're talking about 88 properties, 64 school sites, in gathering uh, assessments on their condition. So I appreciate uh, the patience of the communications division, Ms. Bassanelli and our cabinet, uh, as we gather that information. That information was necessary uh, to be able to communicate in a timely and very concise manner uh, to our families and staff. And I think the communications department did a fantastic job in gathering that information and pushing it out uh, very timely. So I appreciate their efforts as well. And I just want to say thank you to everybody involved uh, with getting our sites open. Uh, now I'll go ahead and turn it over to Mr. Bross to give a little bit more detail uh, on some of the things that occurred. Mr. Bross. Right. Good evening. Uh, good evening, President Creason, members of the board, Superintendent Bassanelli and Ms. Cunningham. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Colin Bross. I'm currently serving as a director of maintenance operations. I do come from the sites, so I've earned a whole new amount of respect for, for what now my department does, and being that I was at a site at once. I was talking to Frank the other day, and I said, when I was a principal, it was just come fix it. You know, I come to work and the, the flood would be gone. But I didn't really understand all of that until 
uh, Sunday at about noon. So <laughs> I'm going to kind of walk you guys through uh, the play by play. It would be impossible for me to give you everything, obviously, and you don't want to hear everything, but I'll give you some of the highlights. So you have a good understanding of what we uh, have done to, to get kids back in school. So uh, one, one thing that I, I do want to say is this has been a, another great example of how well we work as a district when all hands are on deck. So it did remind me of the COVID time when we all kind of had to rally and, and get things going. So this was another example of that. So this actually all started Friday, uh, January 6th. In the evening, it was super windy, super dark and late. And we were called out to Palisades one of the charter schools uh, with a roof leak. Um, so in the dark, our guys were patching a roof. They then had to dry the floors. Uh, they then had to dispatch electricians because water was coming out of electrical outlets. And little did we know that that was just, that was just Friday night. <laughs> that didn't even have Saturday storm. So then comes Saturday. So <clears throat> because we knew of the magnitude of the storm, uh, we made the decision to mobilize staff members throughout the district on Sunday, January 8th. This group consisted primarily of site custodians, but also our MO staff members. We made it out to 76 sites Sunday um, before the sun was down. Our team was tasked with determining if their sites had any leaks, down trees, power outages, and ponding water. Our goal was to pinpoint these areas that presented hazards for the staff who'd be returning on Monday, as well as prior prioritizing the tasks that needed to be accomplished before students and community members returned to campuses. As a direct result of this mobilization, we were able to determine the following. 23 sites were without power. Several trees were down in fields and in paths of travel, parking lots, and roadways. Roof leaks at multiple sites some major ponding on sites, but nothing made it into classrooms from the ponding. Roofs is another story, but I'll get there. Uh, and then a massive amount of tree debris uh, throughout our campuses. While discovering the damage that was already done was, was important, another key aspect of this process was the fact that we were able to do some small mitigation. So we were able to, where roofs were leaking, that person was able to put a garbage can so it didn't create a floor issue. Um, you know, uh, debris that would be tossed around, possibly break windows and cause further damage was pulled aside into a safe area. We also had mi minor drain clogs that would be cleared as to not create a larger problem moving forward. So all of those small things, I believe, prevented major issues down the road. Then came Monday. <clears throat> so with our extensive list of findings on Sunday, our supervisor team met super early in the morning and we began deploying our staff based on the priority list. Uh, during Monday morning, it was impressive to see all of our shops work together to take appropriate action to make sure schools would open in time. I'm just gonna highlight uh, four situations, but obviously there's many more. So grounds, gardeners, and plumbers tackled an uprooted tree, tree uh, at Mission Avenue. That also pulled the water main. So the water main, so the district shut the water off. Within three hours, the tree was gone and the water main was fixed. So we, we have a real group of experts on our staff. Uh, Thomas Kelly had a large tree fall on an overhang. Within hours, our team and staff members removed the tree and then our carpenters followed and fixed any minor repairs to the structure. The roof leak hit pasture, two classrooms were impacted. Uh, but by the end of the day, the roof was patched, the classrooms were drying, and, and students occupied those rooms today. Uh, no further damage there has been reported. We also have a very strong relationship, as, as Mr. Camarda said, with West Coast Arborist. They've been out the past two days, day and night, removing the larger trees that our guys can't handle, the ones that are leaning up against buildings that require a crane. Uh, they were at Cottage today with a crane, taking a, a tree off a building. They were at Mesa, Arcade, Filbert, and Garfield. And the, the key to this is our grounds department does all of the communicating with them and sends them and dispatch them. So it's a real team effort. I, I just want to make note of this too, because we do spend an extensive amount of money on tree service in our district. But I am happy to announce that every site that we've done site-wide tree work on over the last year and a half, not one of them lost a tree. 
So we believe that what we're doing is, is working and we're going to continue to aggressively do that over the next multiple years to not lose big trees and which obviously cause structure damage, possibly injury. So finally, as of 540 this morning, uh, Barrett and Grand Oaks were our only two sites with no power. Um, since then, Grand Oaks has been regained and we are continuing, fingers crossed, to hear from SMUD on Barrett. We're hoping it will be turned on soon. Um, so with that, I will be happy to take any questions, uh, comments, future plans. <laughs> any questions or comments from the board? Ms. Grefcheck? Or, I'm sorry. Did I misread that? I'm sorry. No, no. Okay. I, I just saw Ben reaching for it, so I thought he was going to get there sooner. I do have a question. Um, what are or who are M&O staff? So uh, we have supervisors in four different supervisors, but we have electricians, we have carpenters, our custodians fall under M&O, um, uh, roofers, every trade you can think of, welders, locksmiths. What does it stand for? Maintenance and operations. Maintenance. Sorry. Okay, that makes sense. I, I'm learning all the acronyms that the district has. We're always learning acronyms in education. Yeah, you guys keep inventing <laughs> more. Them up. Yeah. Um, Frank said it was a huge lift. I think that's an understatement. This was a huge lift. And I will say you disappointed my seventh grade daughter who goes to pasture. She was holding out till the very end that she was not going to have school today. Yeah. Um, but you guys did it. I don't know how, but thank you so much for your hard work. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Mr. Amy. Um, I don't know if applause is a comment or question, but you just deserve a huge round of applause. Yeah. Um, Hope that our staffs are watching because really our staffs deserve that. We we provided guidance and leadership, but our staffs did the heavy lifting, and we appreciate every one yeah. of them. It, it would be very easy to say, "Oh, we can't do that till tomorrow." It's only one day of school. It's only, it's only, it's only. And I think you guys really came and showed up to make sure that almost all the kids could go back today. So I'm grateful. I'll be sure to clip this part out for my staff and just send it to <laughs> Mr. Miller. Oh. Thank you, and, and Colin, thank you for being so proactive on this whole getting out ahead of it and not waiting for the principals to show up at their site and say, hey, I got a flood. Um, so uh, kudos to all the employees. Uh, nothing brings people together like a natural weather event, and uh, this was one such event. I think we have a few more, so stay alert, get some rest for the next one. Ms. Costa. I, too, want to add my thanks. This was monumental. And I actually got to see the crew taking down the tree and uh, at one of the elementary schools, actually several trees and cutting up a tree that had fallen on the ground. They were so professional. They were so courteous. They were courteous of the people in the parking lot. They were courteous of the people around the building. It was so impressive to watch their human relation skills in addition to their amazing skills in handling the problem. So thanks for keeping our kids and our staff safe. And my piggyback is, and it ties into Ms. Costa's comments, is the humanity of it all. Because, you know, the, the many of the crew members had their own power out. You know, they had their own situations going on, their own troubles, you know, with transportation, because they're also weathering a storm, yet still showed up for our kids. And that's amazing. So thank you, thank you. And we know that there's likely more to come. Um, my husband works for SMUD and did a 16-hour day yesterday. So I know that, you know, there's a lot going on. Even though it's not maybe windy and rainy right now, the cleanup in the aftermath is still massive. And I also wanted to point out, I really appreciated what you said about tree safety. We can't wait for things to go bad to it, as front as front of it we can get, as in front of it as we could get the better uh, for safety purposes, not only for our buildings, but <laughs> again, the humans that attend or that occupy the building. So thank you so much for the report. It's really appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And next up, we will hear from Ms. Schnepp. Very hard to follow such good information. <laughs> um, good evening, President Creason, members of the board, Superintendent Bassanelli, and Ms. Cunningham. 
The purpose of this report is to update the board regarding parents' concerns around Rio Americano's math department. Principal Kelly is meeting regularly with the math department to share the concerns that were presented at the last board meeting and discuss math department practices. The department recognizes the need to clarify grading practices, commit to creating a wide variety of ways for parents and students to access information, and to increase additional learning opportunities for students around concepts not mastered. To help clarify grading practices and to also increase access to information, Rio is preparing an information night to present to families that will occur on January 26. These informational meetings will be held both in person and on Zoom. These will also be recorded so that families who are not able to attend can also view those presentations. The advertisements for these meetings will be broadly communicated in a wide variety of fashions so that all families are able to um, get the information about the upcoming um, family presentations. The presentation will include and focus on the goal and purpose, which is to communicate to families the key concepts for skills-based learning, which is a little bit different than the traditional math concepts. Information related to grading practices will also be covered based on questions that were raised by the students and the families. Information on the pathways to achieving a score of one, two, three, or four within the skills-based approach will also be addressed. And information related to additional instructional supports will be provided. Also, we will have FAQ opportunities. So gathering all of the questions that both students and families have um, created, we are building an FAQ to provide to families to address many of those questions that they had. In addition to the scheduled math department presentation, Principal Kelly has um, done quite a few things to help support those families and students and also the teachers. He sent an email to parents communicating the next steps the math department will be taking. He met with the math department to discuss feedback and concerns and has met with them um, two or three times in the last week. IM2 teachers will be meeting to create alignment of their syllabus and their grading practices to make it a little more clear for families. They've connected with the math program specialist in our PLI department to help plan next steps for some professional learning that the math department has identified. One of those is a book study called Grading for Equity. And then also they are looking at some upcoming summer conferences that, um, that they are interested in pursuing. Principal Kelly is also, in conjunction with the math department, going to continue to do a few things um, and focusing on increasing tutoring opportunities through zero period and then also targeted classrooms during the day. Really looking at those students who are in the higher level math classes who might have an open period who could push into the IM1 and IM2 to support those students who are struggling. They are going to be looking at ways to explore peer tutoring and use um, a wider a wider array of facilities so that they can have more students access the tutoring. So moving it to larger classrooms, the library areas where more students can have access. Um, they will continue to meet with teachers to discuss how to more clearly articulate grades, both in Google Classroom and then also how to read those grades in Q so that parents are able to understand what those grades represent. They are going to continue to work with the district to conduct a math centered student listening session. We did a parent student or a parent listening session, and we also are focusing now on what are the um, key areas that students want to um, get additional supports in. And then Principal Kelly will continue to visit math classrooms to re review instructional practices and use these observations to discuss next steps and best practices. So updates to the board and the public on this work will be ongoing. We will provide continual communications um, and we will focus on additional channels of communication and opportunities to engage our parents at Rio Americano as well. Um, and then in addition to that, we're working on a full report on mathematics in San Juan Unified School District, and we will be presenting that um, board agenda item on March 26th. 
Principal Kelly was going to stay to answer questions with me, but they have a very huge basketball game that will be standing room only at El Camino. And so um, I needed to let him go so he could help supervise that basketball game. I am here to answer any general questions you might have. Thank you so much for the update. Really appreciate it. Mr. Hernandez. Thank you. Ms. Snap, I yeah, appreciate the report. And it sounds like, you know, we, we're getting a communication path to our parents and community, which is outstanding. My question has to do with those students that have already taken these classes and their situation now, you know, obviously the semester just ended and they may have to retake a math class. Have we thought about some options for them maybe independent study, whether that be summer school, have we communicated with those students as well as the, uh, the future students within these baskets? Yes, grades were just submitted yesterday. So the counseling team at Rio Americano is in the process of reviewing grades. Um, as, as, as the semester progresses, students will have the option to do independent study, they can do APEX, which is an option for any student for credit recovery. We will have summer school also available. So there's a lot of different ways students can um, repeat a course as needed. And the counselors will work with them to make sure it's an individualized plan for those students. Thank you. One clarifying question though, before we move on, it's my understanding Rio is not block, right? So folks that are in IM, what, or it, all their classes now, they'll continue through if they're- Correct. So they still have some time in the current year too. Okay. Yep. There is a second semester. Yeah. Any other questions or comments from that? Mr. Miller? Uh, thank you, President Creason. Uh, Kristen, um, this particular um, skills-based learning and uh, math, math curriculum, is this unique to Rio Americana? Do we have it at other high schools? Um, currently, right now, Rio is one of our only schools using skills-based. Okay, that, that makes sense. Um, and it is an approach, the presentation is really going to identify and target how they landed on the process of using skills base, which started about five years ago. Um, Myron Dewitt came out and really talked to uh, many of our math teachers about <laughs> grading practices. And this is something that's very similar to what we do in our elementary schools. It is really around standards-based grading. And so it's making sure that our students understand skills and key concepts. Um, and then build upon that. Yes. And so it's really able to help students identify where their gaps are because it's targeting very specific skills. Thank you. Okay. Well, again, thank you for the report. Appreciate being con uh, the continued updates, not only to us, but to the students and to uh, uh, to the parents as well. And also just want to reiterate, we're just really happy that we're going to do all that we can for the kids that are currently in the class to have the support that they need to pass because they do still have the rest of the year <laughs> to get there. So thank you. Thank you. We are now at item F. Do we have visitor comments? We do have speaker cards for general visitor comment. Comments are limited to two minutes. The clock on the screen counts down the time. Under the Ralph M. Brown Act, the board is not allowed to comment on any items that are not on the agenda. So we're not ignoring your comments. We just can't respond to any individual comments. The superintendent can refer items to staff who can follow up with you. Ms. Rye, please facilitate public comment. Certainly, we have one visitor comment today. Is First up is Mr. Michael Seaman. Thank you. The lame duck school board made a big mistake by voting for a large middle school at Creekside. It waited five months after its decision, discretionary decision last January to invoke CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act, and thereby invalidating the entire CEQA process. It belittled, trivialized, or ignored citizen concerns, including refusing to consider alternative campus and building designs for the new middle school. It prioritized expenditures for new buildings instead of focusing on academic performance deficiencies. It kept the vast majority of district parents and taxpayers in the dark about the project. The site is marginal, suboptimal in size, constrained by flood, fire, habitat, and neighborhood impact issues. It's an accessibility and traffic nightmare waiting to happen. The public will not look kindly on your district when it sees the outcome and its associated price. The old board could have paused the process to create a win-win situation. 
Instead, it rushed ahead to create, make the win-lose case that now exists. Your administration and its consultants are the winners. Students and the community are the losers. An example is the fake access to the nature area, the surrounding neighborhoods only open space. The only way to get there now is from Lacey Lane. It's very hard for most people to get to the Lacey Lane path. Emergency and maintenance vehicles cannot use it. Making everyone wait until 2024 is not acceptable. Your newly constituted board has an opportunity to undo the errors of the old board. You could put the project on hold and have a real dialogue with the public. By listening and responding in good faith, you could show that transparency and good stewardship matter more than backroom deals with consultants and contractors. If you revisit the district's master facilities plan, you can find valid alternatives for fixing Encina and repurposing other district properties. An honest and sincere facilities planning process can restore public trust. Thank you for your comment. And that is our final public comment. Thank you. We are at item G, consent calendar. Do any board members wish to remove any items from the consent calendar? Seeing none, is there a motion to approve items G1 through G7? So moved. Second. Moved by Mr. Miller, seconded by Mr. Hernandez. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any, the, any opposed? The motion passes 6-0. We are at item I-1, universal pre-kindergarten update. Ms. Townsend Snyder. Good evening, board president Peterson, members of the board, Superintendent Bassanelli, Ms. Cunningham, Happy New Year. It's really nice to see all of you here. We're excited to share with you this evening a very large plan for UPK. You've probably heard quite a bit about it over the last year. Um, we are bringing to you a continuum that's known as UPK. We call it Universal Pre-K. And tonight's presentation will spotlight transitional kindergarten along with some connections to preschool and the five focus areas for planning and implementation. We will also share with you the input and feedback themes that we heard from parent groups and staff, as well as areas we feel we can grow and improve in our next steps together. We intend to return in June to all of you with another UKK update, where we will share with you the 23-24 school site locations where additional TK classes will be added. And any further progress that we've made with UPK will be shared with you at that time as well. You will also hear a little tonight a bit more about our UPK plan in an upcoming Early Childhood Education Board update. So we're going to touch on preschool this evening. You will also hear more in another board presentation about UPK and how it affects preschool. The UPK continuum does span numerous divisions, so we do have a lot to share with you. Um, this really is a learning year for all of us. So tonight it's really important and we welcome your comments and your questions because we know that everything that you share with us will help us just get better and better as we learn and grow together. I'm joined tonight by Cassie Bennett, who's the Director of Elementary Education in K-8. She also has direct oversight of the UPK planning and implementation. In addition, she used to be a preschool teacher, so she's very familiar with UPK work. Also listening this evening virtually is Diana Marshall, she was joining us this tonight. She's our manager and uh, program manager in human resources who plays a very pivotal role in helping us with our recruitment, retention, and workforce development. So she's listening online and we thank her for being here with us virtually. She's at home not feeling well. In December of 2021, legislation was enacted that required all school districts to implement a plan for the universal pre-K continuum. In the spring of 21-22, we began gathering input and feedback from our families, staff, labor partners, community partners, which we used to plan for the implementation of UPK this fall. UPK will support equitable access to early education, focusing on inclusive, culturally, and linguistically affirming programs 
for all of our four-year-old children, early learning options are provided through a menu of resources and pre-kindergarten learning experiences that our families have the opportunity to choose from to meet their needs individually, including Head Start, State Preschool, and Transitional Kindergarten. This initiative comes with a renewed focus on aligned pre-kindergarten, also called pre-K, through third grade, which is referred to as P3 in the presentation. And these learning opportunities are very rigorous, developmentally informed, high quality, joyful, and inclusive. As children's first and most important teacher, there is a renewed and extensive focus on families. UPK intends to express to families the need that we have for them as a part of developing this process. It also helps and intends to expand resources and opportunities for our families, empowering them as valued, supported, and well-informed partners in their children's development and learning in and outside of the classroom. Just over a year ago, the California Department of Education released a template for local education agencies like San Juan to use for, fam for planning the rollout of our universal pre-K plan. The five focus areas shown on this slide supported all of the elements of planning for impl implementation from creating a local vision to engaging the local community, hiring staff, training staff, developing high quality curriculum, and assessment practices, as well as planning for the facilities that would be needed to support this initiative. San Juan formed a collaborative team that included multiple departments and labor groups, in addition to families for UPK plan implementation. This was required by legislation. The intent of the state was for districts, county offices, and other educational agencies to leverage grant funds, such as the UPK grant, the Workforce Development Grant, along with other funding sources such as ELOP funding, you'll hear about all of that in the upcoming presentation. In order to implement these plans for UPK, we knew we had to braid together multiple funds and that was the intent of the state. With this UPK initiative, the district will now be receiving ADA for four-year-old students who are enrolled in TK and that results in an increased revenue, which is needed to sustain this program. So that is what will keep us rolling through for the rest of time. And it's kind of exciting. The following presentation is sharing the ways that these focus areas of planning have come together for our UPK implementation. Cassie Bennett will now join me at the podium and take us through the very fine details of the five focus areas and what implementation looks like and what it sounds like through the video and a voice where you will hear and see kids learning and playing alongside their teachers in multiple classrooms. You will also hear from a parent who shares her experience and her family's journey through early learning with us. With that, I pass it to Cassie. Thank you and good evening. Uh, Universal Pre-K is being implemented based on a phase in approach over five years. Um, the age qualifications for transitional kindergarten will be shifting by a couple of months each year. And it's not my favorite thing to do, but I, need, I do need to point out that there is um, the 24-25 column says September 2nd and April 2nd. That actually should say June 2nd, so I will change that. Um, so the legislation has reduced the TK class size from 26 to 1 and now requires us to maintain a ratio of 12 students to every adult. As a result, each TK teacher will have a class size maximum of 24 students with an IA in the room. As you can see on the chart, we had 14 TK classrooms in the 21-22 school year. In September of that year, we had nearly 300 students enrolled um, at the beginning of the year. And then by April, we had 306 students enrolled in TK. So enrollment tends to increase throughout the year. Um, based on early projections for 22-23, we believed we would need 20 TK classrooms for this school year. We had 434 students enrolled in August, and by November, that number had grown to 447 students. So we currently have a total of 24 TK classrooms or TK kindergarten combination classes. 
So students who are not old enough to qualify for TK might qualify for some of our preschool options, part of our ECE division, such as state preschool, Head Start, depending on income qualifications, or our Early Learning Academy preschool, which is a fee-based program. Early projections indicate that we might have approximately 200 or more additional TK students for next year, which will translate into about eight to 10 more classrooms needed. Okay. So the UPK legislation also requires school districts to offer access to nine hours of daily programming for young students. The Expanded Learning Opportunities Program, which we refer to as ELOP, another one of those acronyms, provides ongoing funding for after school and summer school enrichment programs for transitional kindergarten through sixth grade. As a result, we have leveraged ELOP funds to expand access for TK students to after school programs such as Bridges, Discovery Club, YMCA, and other site based ELOP programs. So through the planning process, we engaged in information and input gathering sessions with several parent and community groups. Some major themes that emerged were families really felt that options are very important. Some felt that the preschool program would be a better fit for their child while others preferred a TK option. Some families even shared that within their family, they might have one child who might be a better fit for preschool and another student who might be a better fit for TK. With the legislative changes, it has become apparent that not all families are aware of the changes in age requirements and the expanded options available to them. Later in the video, you will hear a parent talk about her child who had a late December birthday. Initially, she didn't believe her child would qualify for TK and was surprised, actually excited, when she found out that the birth date cutoff had been extended to February this year. We currently work with Central Enrollment and the Communication Department um, to inform families about program options for their young children. Strategies being used include social media and websites, newsletters, calls, emails, texts, and flyers, which are available at San Juan Central and on our FaceMobile through the Family and Community Engagement Department. Many families spoke about concerns with having sufficient staff, training, and supports to meet the needs of children with disabilities or children who are multilingual. Later in the presentation, we will be sharing some of the work we've been doing around building a strong, diverse workforce and providing professional learning, including supports for multilingual students and students with disabilities. We will continue gathering input from families in a variety of ways through annual surveys, listening sessions, and community meetings. So teaching TK is unique in that teachers at this level are required to have more than a multiple subject teaching credential. By next school year, all TK teachers are required to have, also have 24 ECE units or other relevant experience. We joined a countywide consortium and have been awarded a workforce development grant funds, which we are using to support the building of a strong diverse workforce. Diana Marshall, who Amberly spoke about earlier in our HR department has been an integral part of the work of leveraging these grant funds and creating multiple pathways to recruit, hire, and retain high quality TK teachers with all of the credentialing requirements. Utilizing this workforce development grant funding, we created a partnership with American River College to support credentialed teachers in obtaining the 24 units needed to qualify for teaching TK. Through informational sessions, we provided any interested practitioners with the information needed to join the cohort. The grant allows a capacity of 10 participants each year for three years for a total of 30 practitioners um, who will become eligible to teach TK. At the time that this presentation was being prepared, we had eight teachers participating. In the past week, we've added two additional TK teachers to the ARC cohort for a total of 10 teachers this year. We're scheduled to complete a second round of information sessions to interested teachers in early February with the goal of recruiting for the next cohort in the ARC partnership. While certificated teachers will have priority enrollment, we also have an opportunity for our classified staff, which we'll talk about in the next slide. In our teacher residency program funded through the CTC teacher residency grant, we have three participants this year and we'll have an additional three participants next year who have completed the 24 units in ECE and will be working toward earning their credential, making them fully qualified to teach TK. 
excuse me. As districts across the state have experienced staffing shortages, SJUSD has taken steps to take to create many pathways for current and future employees to join the workforce as early learning practitioners. As mentioned in the previous slide, we have the MOU with American River College um, that allows us to use the grant funding to get teachers the 24 units that they need. Um, for early, for our current early childhood education teachers who are not credentialed, but hold a child development permit and want to teach TK, we're able to offer contracts in a TK position with a short-term emergency teaching permit which qualifies them to teach TK while they participate in an internship credentialing program through SCOE, Sacramento County Office of Education, CSUS, or other higher learning institutions. For the 22-23 school year, we hired three preschool teachers as TK teachers, so they'd previously been preschool teachers, and anticipate approximately the same number in years to follow. Through natural attrition, this has not had a negative impact on our ECE staffing, but we have also developed a plan in anticipation of any impacts that the expansion of TK may have on ECE staffing in the future. The plan is to offer our classified staff the opportunity to gain the 24 units through ARC that they would need in order to earn a child development permit, which would allow them to teach in our ECE program. So it's sort of a pipeline. Um, additional efforts have been made to recruit and build an early learning workforce, including three times a year, classified employees receive communication about the credentialing pathways. The purpose is to inform employees of the different types of teacher credentialing programs and the steps required to successfully obtain a teaching credential. We also have done strategic recruitment of San Juan Unified classified employees into the Alder Teaching Residency Program. So for the 23-24 Alder cohort, we have three residents slotted for TK. All of them are current district employees. As mentioned in the previous slide, we're reserving three teacher residency slots for TK applicants each year. So we're hoping through this, maintaining this variety of pathways and focused recruitment and retention efforts, we can meet the need of a strong and diverse workforce for our early learning programs. A big part of building a high quality program involves providing high quality training and professional development to practitioners, including teachers, instructional assistants, and administrators. Funded through the UPK grant dollars, a team of San Juan experts have worked together to plan a learning series around a variety of topics, including trauma-informed practices, universal design for learning, strategies for including students with disabilities, and supports for multilingual learners. For the areas of curriculum and instruction, our practitioners are provided with the board adopted TK and kindergarten curriculum and have access to supplemental curricular materials and professional learning around the preschool learning foundations. They also have access to materials and training in the science of reading and best practices for developmentally appropriate play-based learning experiences, including assessment strategies for early learning environments and kindergarten readiness. Our TK teachers have a monthly collaborative where they meet to calibrate, plan, and align for best practices. We also have an experienced TK teacher who's fully released from our classroom, whose responsibility is to provide each TK teacher with individualized coaching around best practices within the TK classroom. Many of our practitioners are attending both in-district and out-of-district professional learning. We also partner with SCOE and other community agencies, such as First Five, to offer learning opportunities for our employees. Okay, so one of the biggest challenges statewide is, is also one of our biggest challenges, which continues to be around ample facilities for expanding our program offerings. Many of the communities with higher projected enrollment are in areas where the school buildings are already impacted and classroom space is at a premium. Our facilities department has been able to utilize bond dollars to add new facilities to some of our schools listed on the slide and to purchase new furniture for all of our new TK classrooms. Okay, here we have a video. And in your head, I can hear it. <laughs> all right, here we go. Let's do it together now. Did you see how they were kind? Yes. yes. They used their kind words. They're, they're run away with Miss Grindall. <laughs> 
The big focus of transitional kindergarten is giving the students an opportunity to build their social emotional growth. Because it's a universal rollout, it's going to be available to everyone. We spend much of the day learning how to speak to one another, how to respect our environment and respect our peers. So watching children who realistically don't have a lot of ways to communicate, not only communicate but actually engage and be friends together is really unique. As they move into kindergarten, they will already have that great foundational experience of letters and letter sounds and exposure to sight words, high frequency words. To have these ones that are already ready to learn, they're going to be our leaders in the classroom and help support and bring up the other ones that have not had that same experience. If you think it's a cat, show me cat. Nosotros llegamos hace seis años a este país y mi hija de 10 años tenía cinco años cuando comenzó TK. No, no tenía tanta familiarización con el idioma, entonces para ella fue un parteaguas el entrar a un nuevo idioma, a un nuevo mundo, a, a nuevos conocimientos de aprendizaje educativo y le ayudó y le dieron muchas herramientas, muchas bases de aprendizaje. Gracias a que estuvo en TK, ella pudo fortalecer mucho más los lazos educativos educativos con un, con un nuevo idioma que, que es el inglés. Uh, what's this right here? Foot. It, well, it's not just a foot. It's your whole leg. leg. We have a large growing population of families that have multiple siblings and the campus with TK Incorporated provides an opportunity bringing their four-year-olds to a place that they know and that they know the teachers, they know the community. It makes them feel a little bit more secure and comfortable. So we're getting to know the families in a different way because we can see the whole family coming in. También igual, casi no le iba a tocar TK por, por su edad, que él es en diciembre y antes, antes las fechas eran distintas, se terminaba el periodo del primero de diciembre. Entonces yo deseaba tanto que él estuviera en TK. Inclusive cuando estaba en preescolar me decía, yo quiero ir a TK, yo quiero ir a TK, yo quiero estar en TK. Entonces era como cuando nos dijeron, si sí, va a entrar a TK, fue, ah, fue, hicimos fiesta en casa. Porque, Porque sabíamos a dónde iba y todo lo que iba a aprender. On the first day of school, when the transitional kindergartners came into the classroom and saw the very warm and welcome environment, and that it fit their size, and they had opportunities to play with all the toys that were provided, you could feel the excitement from the students. Going from a classroom that was a third of the size of this room, but now to have a room that is this spacious and beautiful, that has been the world of difference for us. This is our space, it's like our, our kinderland here. Those children who have had that opportunity to get a little more mature before they hit those junior high and high school challenges, they're going to be more of a leader than a follower. Can you move to the next slide? A little soft rock would be nice. <laughs> Am I pointing at my attention to you? Yeah. <laughs> next slide. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Okay, so some of our next steps as we plan into the future include continuing to analyze enrollment trends, staffing and facility needs as our programs expand. We'll also continue to work on recruiting and building our diverse workforce. A big focus will be on continuing to improve our communication to the community and ensure families know of enrollment qualifications and options. We will also gather input from staff and community around implementation so that we can continue to improve our program offerings. A team of practitioners will be convened to continue the work around the alignment of curriculum standards and assessments for high quality teaching and learning. 
Working on the alignment from preschool to third grade will support smooth transitions and access to high quality programs for our student, all of our students and families. Finally, we will continue to focus on professional learning for our staff and collaboration with community partners, including our Sacramento County Consortium to leverage the community supports for our programs. Additionally, we will plan to increase outreach to other community agencies, such as resettlement agencies and pediatric offices, so they can provide families with information about program options for their children. Thank you for your time tonight, hearing about the work we've been doing. At this time, Board President Creason, we're open to any questions the board may have. Thank you so much. Questions, comments from the board? Mr. Ailey? All right. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I will say I'm a big fan of TK. Uh, two of my kids went through TK at Legat. Uh, hopefully, fingers crossed, uh, another one will be there next year. Um, I did also want to say my, my fourth child wasn't eligible, wasn't age eligible, but she was able to go to, I think it was a grant funded camp that was offered um, that kind of helped her before she went in, into kindergarten. I will say that was a really big support for her. And so as we are going through implementation for those students who may not have a TK on their campus, um, I will say firsthand experience that was very helpful um, in the absence of a full TK program. So um, I, I do have some uh, questions beyond just you know my praise. Um, when you were talking about uh, community engagement, do you guys meet with the local site councils to talk about what local implementation might look like? Um, I know you talked about community engagement. Was that more just at a higher level with parent groups? Yeah, so the for the first year, um, the, the template came out last December, I think December 17th. And so the, the next few months for that first year of planning, we met with several community groups and um, we didn't get down to groups at the site level at that point in time. We did like um, the district ELAC committee, DLAC, um, the superintendent's parent advisory committee, so SPAC, um, you know, some of our other committees, curriculum standards. And so we kind of focused on some of the more district wide committees. Um, but in terms of our next steps, we're trying, you know, we have other opportunities, you know, meeting with site councils could be one of them. We have surveys that we're sending out to all the families in our early learning programs um, and getting information that way. So we have plans in the works, but always open to more opportunities for hearing from folks for sure. Great, thank you. And then on the recruitment side of things, obviously this is a whole new cohort of folks coming in. Um, on the credentialing and certification, is that all statewide standards or do we have local um, feedback on that, input on that? Cause it sounds like it's, it's pretty high bar. Um, yeah, to the, be teaching in that TK. It, that is a state requirement. Okay. Um, so the CTC requires that teachers have a credential and the 24 units to teach TK. Okay. And yeah. you are right. It is a high bar. It's uh -huh. above and beyond what our kindergarten. Yeah. And I just worry about, I mean, it's, yeah. there's a shortage right now. So. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. They okay. did give us a little bit of an out. So teachers who've been teaching um, TK prior to 2015 or grandfathered in. So it's really just teachers who've been hired since then. And that's why we've kind of worked with the county and our local agencies like ARC, CSUS, SCOE in creating those pathways because it's, it's a heavy lift to get people fully credentialed, um, you know, when you could teach third grade and, and not require as much in terms of credentialing. And then just my last question, do open enrollment policies, um, we'll actually be discussing it later in the agenda, but does open enrollment policies apply to TK the same or is enrollment in TK treated differently? It's a little bit different because it's not offered at all of our sites yet. So there, we, we open enrollment and it's a lottery system. So, you know, we hold the lottery and then inform parents. It was interesting this last year going through that you know, this is the first year that I've been overseeing this work and working with San Juan Central. Um, a lot of families who got into to sites didn't end up enrolling their children. So then we go to a waiting list situation. And by the time that entire process was completed, we were able to get just about everyone who had originally applied for the lottery, either in a seat or to say, yeah, we changed our mind. We don't, we think we're going to wait until next year. 
Thank and you. then, yeah, and I, what I anticipate, I, I guess I don't know for sure, but once TK is offered at all sites, then it would be more subject to the open enrollment process than it is now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Other questions, comments from the board? Ms. Krejcik? So a few comments, a few questions. Um, I'm a big believer in early childhood education, so I'm really excited about this. My uh, youngest, uh, we, well, we don't have TK at Green Oaks, but um, he, whenever I drop off the kids, he always takes his backpack in the car and he thinks he's going to school. He's very, dis every day, he's, it's a surprise to him that he's not getting out of the car. But he's very disappointed, he can't wait. Um, I hope that's his attitude, you know, in the future when <laughs> he actually true. goes to school, but I'm, I'm really excited about this. I have a few questions. The expanded learning opportunity, uh, you listed some of the agencies that you work with. Um, how does that work right now for before school? Since we have started school later, is there an opportunity to include some of that, um, some of those hours before school? Yeah, so our Discovery Club program and the YMC program that we currently have um, offer before school hours. And as of now, Bridges is just after school. Um, I think they're you know, at the time that we were talking about how to implement this, there was some talk about trying to offer some of our other programs before school, but the staffing shortages were preventing us from even getting the after school program staff. So um, at this time, we've kind of focused on getting that fully up and running. And there are still considerations, though, for how to offer more before school child care. So does TK start at the same time that the school where it's housed starts? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just to layer into that too, um, one of the things that the school sites are able to do is um, like all, one of the really great examples is the work with our VAPA teams. So we do have our VAPA team engaging at various school sites to provide before and after school learning opportunities. So choir and band, and those can all be paid, through, paid for through ELOP mm -hmm. because they are extending the school day for kids. Can you help is, with those acronyms real quick? Yes, thank you. Sure. So ELO, ELO P is the Expanded Learning Opportunity Program. BAPA is Visual and Performing Arts. Okay, there you go. How many more did I ramble off there in one <laughs> That was a one. I'm taking notes up here, so we'll review it later. <laughs> I feel like we need a little, you know, like all of us, a little list. Like this means that now. Uh-huh, cheat sheet. Yeah, yes, I'm with you. I was excited to hear you say that you're going to work with resettlement agencies or at least to broadcast the information because particularly now with the influx of the refugees that we have in this area, I think that's very smart. Um, okay, more things. Um, I was also excited to hear about the professional learning opportunities and kind of, I, I hope that you can can do this. It's daunting to have the teachers go through so much of the training uh, but the one that stood out to me was the trauma-informed practices. And it kind of, um, I used to work at a domestic violence shelter and then a shelter for abused kids. So this is very close to my heart. Uh, but I definitely have seen the need for this increase uh, in recent years. And particularly after COVID, a lot of our um, very youngest were impacted. I'm wondering, um, are there plans for like speech therapy or other kinds of occupational therapy, something that we can work with them on skills that they maybe just never had an opportunity to build? For the students. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, in terms of those program, those services are offered through a special education department. So um, like my son has an IEP and when he was a young, you know, he was a kindergarten during COVID. So he did all the distance learning and um, so when I got, when he went to school, I had to, you know, he went through the process of being assessed and started receiving services in that way. So that's sort of the process for the students who need speech services or occupational therapy would be to do it through an assessment process with the special education team. Go ahead. We also have our MTSS, multi-tiered system of support, <laughs> another acronym. Um, and they are at all of our school sites and can support and help us too. They have counselors, behavior specialists, and, and support us in all those needs regarding trauma-informed care. Yeah, um, a thought that I had um, this morning, I had a call with um, the director of our foundation. We were just talking about grants, and I know that there are a lot of potential grants for trauma-informed care, so I wonder if we could... I'm totally like not giving you instructions at all. Just an idea of um, maybe one of the sites could be a trauma informed care site, and then there's opens up an opportunity for additional funding, but also really serves the needs of our community if that need is there. And then my final question um, 
So you listed the new facilities, but what about the other school sites? Do they just have extra classrooms that we're not utilizing right now? Like where are these TK class classes going physically? Uh, oh, it's okay. <laughs> are you asking about the ones that we're adding? In the ones that you're adding, yeah. thank you. That's a great question. Um, and we're looking at how where we have natural attrition. So let's say for example, we have four sixth grade classes and the following year we would only have three we would have natural attrition of a classroom. We would try and use a classroom at that site for a TK class. Okay, Otherwise, so it served the, sorry for interrupting. So it served the needs of that area. It's not necessarily a correlation between they have a lot of fourth, four-year-olds and not so much sixth graders. Yeah, it's, it's really trying to capture the classroom because we assume that we're gonna have a need at every single site. Our goal is to have TK at every school. Yes, that's a great Does goal. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you okay. so much. You're welcome. Thank you for your input too regarding the trauma informed piece. When we opened, we led with, you know, this is a learning year for us, and we really do want your questions and input because it will only help us get better. So thank you. Really thank you. It. Mr. Miller. Oh, thank you. And thank you for the presentation. As a new board member and part of my education, I feel like I'm at the TK level. <laughs> um, so I'm going to be learning over the next year as well. But I, no, I appreciate uh, getting a better understanding of, of what we're doing up front. Uh, I know we didn't have this when my daughter went to kindergarten and she was old enough, but she wasn't mature enough. And I wish we'd had this sort of thing because we had, we held her back. So, because we wanted her to be a leader and not a follower. And, uh, that, that made a big difference. She never forgave us, but that's another story. So thank you. Thank you. Ms. Costa. You've obviously built a pipeline for our classified staff, and it's really exciting to see, and I think it will make a difference in staffing, having had the experience with NCE and, and the staffing needs for our preschool programs. It's great that you've got a pipeline started for this program. Are there any plans to recruit high school students and get them excited early so that they could go through the training program as well. Yeah, I'm glad that you mentioned that. I think we talked about that actually in June when we presented the initial planning to the board. Um, there are plans to recruit at the high school level. Um, we also have CTE pathways for students who are pursuing careers in education. And I'm not the CTE expert, but I think we have a program at Encina, Encina. yeah, starting at Encina. And um, Diana isn't here to speak to it directly, but I know she has also done some outreach to graduating high school students for job opportunities in our classified ranks as well. So it really is, we really are trying to build a true pipeline from high school graduation up, you know, through fully credentialed teachers or, or whatever aspirations folks have. That's a little something that we like to brag about. It's unique mm -hmm. to us. And we built these programs using these grant funds with intention of trying to capture our kids that graduate from our schools to move into the teaching profession. So it's really cool and very unique to us. So we're very proud of it. Thank you for that. The other thing that I keep thinking about is the curriculum and how strong Sam Juan's TK programs are right now. And when you visit the programs, it is above and beyond in, every single classroom. So perhaps there's a way for us to have a place at the table with the state to help us. They come up with curriculum for TK um, that we can help guide them to do some of the things that Sam Juan's doing right now. We agree. We feel like we're exceeding the standard right now. Um, and we hope to continue to push into that and would love help the creation of what it might look like for other kids. Mr. Miller, part two. Yeah, thank you. Um, in, in all my joking around, I forgot to ask the question. Um, <laughs> on the vision and coherence slide with enrollment projections, does that, and you don't have to go to that slide, I just wanted to know, does that just go to program capacity? We're not looking at an enrollment trend, are we, that we're expecting uh, more kids? more students? Yeah, the reason why we'll have more students is because as the birth date deadline extends, so for example, this year, we only, we had, um, well, last year, we only had about 300 students who qualified because it, the birthday cutoff was December 2nd. 
Mm -hmm. So this year it extended to February 2nd, which included about 200 additional students. So as the birth date cutoff extends each year, we'll be able to bring on more and more four-year-olds. Does that make sense? Oh, uh, yeah. I was hoping you talked to a demographer and we were going to see an increase in enrollment. Well, there's that, that too. <laughs> because I, <laughs> I always joked in 2020, in 21, 22, when we first got the template that we were projecting enrollment for kids who weren't born yet because we're projecting for 25, 26. Mm -hmm. And some of the kids who would be starting school would be three or four and we're projecting five years out. So yeah, the, it is difficult, but we do, I know Frank could speak to a process we use um, with a demographer to get all of that birth rate information and things for the different um, areas. So your hope is accurate. Mm -hmm. and yeah. Kudos to Frank. On it's that. a very detailed report. Thank you. <laughs> Any other? I'm very excited about the program and I'm just going to leave it at one point. Um, I'm really excited about the outreach that you mentioned that we're not expecting folks to just know and come to us because you don't know what you don't know. Um, so we're going out to where we know they will be so they can be informed. That's wonderful. And I have many, many other thoughts, but I won't, I won't bore you with them. That's a little off for later. You but never bore us. <laughs> and that's an area where you saw it's a growth area for us on our last slide. So it's something that we're absolutely open to other ideas that we might be missing so keep it coming awesome thank you so much for your report you're welcome thank, thank you. you thank you we are now at item i2 safe schools program overview mr allen Thank you, President Creason, members of the board, Superintendent Bassanelli and Ms. Cunningham. Good evening. Safety in its many forms, of course, is always a top priority for all of our educators and those safety challenges that we face continue to grow and evolve over time. So our safe schools program in the district, which has been operating for several decades now, also continues to grow and evolve over time. Uh, while we continue to have a strong relationship with local law enforcement in 2017, 2018, uh, we did evolve our program to a different kind of model where rather than relying on off-duty officers to provide most of the staffing for the program, we shifted to a model where we use our own safety specialists who can be on campuses more consistently than the off-duty model where those off-duty officers, just because of the structure of their off-duty program from their employer, really couldn't be there on a consistent basis. So we really focused on those relationships so that we can really focus on those things that are preventative. Um, really making sure that we're doing planning, those drills, and then of course, looking at response as well. So I'm gonna have our director of safe schools, uh, Michael Jones come up and he's gonna walk you through the current program design and some of the efforts. Uh, good evening, President Creason, members of the board, superintendent, Ms. Cunningham. Thank you for allowing me to be here tonight and talk to you about the uh, program and give you this brief overview. Uh, I apologize if I get a little tongue-tied. We're fast approaching my bedtime, so <laughs> I'm not used to being up this late. <laughs> um, I also want to apologize. I'm typically not used to uh, death by PowerPoint in the sense of reading slides to you, but these uh, first specific slides may be coming up, hopefully. Let's see what they're uh, <laughs> set on double clicks for us. Uh, the first few slides, just when we get into our organizational structure as well as our vision, mission, objectives, I think are very important. You know, and as Trent alluded to, the program has been in development since about 2018. And I say in development because we are not done yet. We are still working to improve this program, still working to expand and advance it. Uh, so there's a lot of areas where we are still seeking input and feedback from our sites, from our communities, and those ways that we can do things better. Um, so currently the structure is, includes myself as a director. There is one supervising lead or senior uh, community safety specialist. It kind of serves as a daily uh, team supervisor. We have eight community super, excuse me, eight community safety specialists and one safe routes specialist. The safe route specialist is uh, currently grant funded at this time. Our mission has been drafted and created by the team input. And I think it's important to kind of note because this is new as of this, this last school year. We worked on this over the last couple of years, but it wasn't until really the the onset of the 22-23 school year that we've really kind of honed into what our mission and vision really is for this team. And the mission of the San Juan Unified State School team is to support school administrators, educators, parents, and students to create safer school environments through planning, preparation, and prevention in response to and recovery from natural disasters, criminal acts, and crisis situations. 
That's a pretty expansive mission. There's a lot to encompass there, but the aspect of school safety is very large. So there's a lot for us to do. The overall vision of the team is dedicated to improving campus safety and fostering an educational environment and culture where students can learn, explore, and succeed academically. We utilize both industry best practices and will always seek out innovative methods to improve school safety in partnership with internal district teams, external community organizations, and other school safety resource support groups. We strive to deliver our services professionally, recognizing who our customers are, demonstrating care, concern, and compassion for those that we serve. We think those values are important. This vision is important. Uh, and again, this is new as of this year for this team. So this is a big step for us in the development of it. Our objectives have been really honed in over the course of the last couple of years. And really to outline them, the, the team is here to support all school administrators and sites in developing their comprehensive school safety plans, to develop, uh, excuse me, not to conduct school safety surveys, safety assessments, and vulnerability assessments, and to focus on emergency procedures and drills in our sites. We provide critical response support in the areas of threat assessment, critical incident management, a liaison with our local law enforcement and other emergency first responders, as well as develop individual student safety plans for those uh, related to IEPs, bullying, or other personal or family issues. We also respond and assist with student behavioral crisis, violations of rules and policies on campus, as well as disruptions affecting the overall safety of a site. <laughs> Our community safety specialists, before I go into what they're highly trained in, I wanna make it kind of clear that what they aren't, they're not security guards, they're not law enforcement, they're not armed. They're here on our campus. They are district resources, district personnel, and have no greater authority than any other district personnel. Where their value really is in their training and their expertise and how they can apply those skill sets to assist those school sites in the development of safety, you know, that campus culture towards a greater you know, uh, environment of safety. Some of the things that they are specifically trained in to ensure that they can uh, provide those services through are emergency response procedures, active threat response, critical incident management and communication, federal incident uh, command system, which is ICS, crisis communication, de-escalation skills, behavioral threat assessment. And we'll touch a little bit on this in a moment with our partnership with uh, law enforcement, but behavioral threat assessment is new to our district in the last year and a half. I've been working collaboratively with our regional threat assessment teams uh, through the county as well as through the uh, Central California Information Centers to really bring the training into this district free of charge initially. To date, we've trained over 200 staff within the district, collaborating at those, uh, it's a multidisciplinary group that we've trained, school counselors, mental health professionals, administrators, safety specialists, as well as bringing in outside organizations such as law enforcement and county uh, mental health professionals into that group. They are all trained in uh, additionally therapeutic crisis intervention, which is really more specific to our special education uh, students, crime prevention through environmental design, school vulnerability and safety assessment completions, as well as mandated reporter requirements. So, as I mentioned, we only have eight safety specialists. I mean, with so many sites, they really are dedicated to a zone coverage versus being assigned to any individual school site. With that being said, they can move where the need is for that day. While the responsibility and objectives are to help with the overall safety planning, they do respond to assist with incidents that are occurring as needed and as required. Typically they are assigned to a zone anchored by a high school and then it's feeder schools moving into it. And that puts between eight and 10 school sites per safety specialist they deal with on an, on an average daily basis, assuming everyone's here. Um, Citrus Heights is unique in the sense that there is one safety specialist primarily assigned to that area with 16 sites that they have, um, but they are received secondary support from two other East End safety specialists. So uh, while one safety specialist might be responsible for the entire area with respect to planning, prevention, uh, and really assisting in those larger uh, efforts, the immediate daily response is kind of doled between three specialists. As I mentioned, the safety assessment and vulnerability studies. This is new that we've uh, began this project this school year. Really, these assessments kind of focus on four main elements. We are look at the school sites and surrounding community crime statistics, 
kind of get an overview of what's going on within the community around that school. What issues are really of, of, of specific concern? The campus physical security itself, its layout, its vulnerability, its access, its ingress, its egress. How vulnerable is it to intruders on the campus itself? Safety planning, training, and existing practices and drills, as well as its overall school culture and environment. When we talk about school culture environment, we're really examining things like what programs and preventative efforts are being done on that campus. What's the overall kind of that school spirit that's there? Is the school seen and viewed as a welcoming environment? Are there programs there to really assist those students who are having difficulty or issues either engaging with their peer groups or being bullied? And what can we do to kind of bring that environment and culture up? Some of the outcomes uh, from the assessments. To date, we have completed all high schools, all middle schools, all K-8s, uh, and are now working on our elementary sites for the studies. Early on, some general themes came out very quickly. Those, uh, and as we looked at how can we improve overall school safety, we decided to take kind of a collective approach to establish a baseline across the district. What do we wanna focus on to really utilize, or I say increase, our district safety as a whole versus individual school sites. Some of the things that came out were going to improve fencing and, and gating to create a single point of entry, ingress and egress access. Why that's valuable is intruder access. On the heels of, or I should say, prior to the studies really kind of beginning, acts of school violence were kind of seen as somewhat on the increase. While in the big picture, they are still very rare incidents. They became very common in the last several years. They seem to occur one or two each year lately. That became a really big issue. And our communities were reaching out saying, hey, how do we control access? How do we limit intruders? How do we make it safer in the environment so that persons who are on our campus are supposed to be here? So the fencing and gating, really, that single point of entry, is if you look at a campus as a whole, you might have its perimeter fencing which kind of establishes its outside boundaries. But the core fencing internally within the campus, fencing that's actually between this, the actual buildings themselves, where only students and staff should be eligible to get in, in and out of. We wanna actually make that consistent throughout the district where we have that core fencing established, where during school hours, that school site can be locked down to where it's just those persons who are supposed to be in. And anyone visiting the campus must go through the actual office in order to check in kind of helps control, you know, our, the safety of our school sites. Classroom security became an issue. Our schools have been built, many of them 50, 60 years old. Every door on the campuses are different. We wanted to ensure that every room where students were primarily engaged would be classrooms, libraries, you know, those students are really active, had the ability to be locked from the inside without a key. and where the person did not have to expose themselves to any risk or threat on the outside should a lockdown have to occur. So we wanna make sure we standardize that. Office and administration control is important. A lot of our offices are the first point of contact. We want them to be able to control who comes in or how quickly they can lock that facility. In an emergency, that staff is critical and their safety and security is important in order to manage the overall crisis. We wanna make sure that was controlled. And then of course, improved signage and pathway marking. That's very important when it comes, not only establishing rules and boundaries for the public coming on our campus, but pathway marking is important for first responders. How quickly can they get to an area on the campus? How quickly can they find it? So those are some of the, uh, the primary themes we wanted to address on the outcomes of our assessments. And we're working with our facilities teams, now kind of engage those uh, actions moving forward and start some of the projects. Our partnerships are very important to us within this team. Internally, while we work very uh, well with all of our, our district partners, we wanted to make a specific note to our communications team and facilities teams. So many of our safety issues and, uh, that we deal with almost take a life of their own. Threats of possible school violence you know, via social media very quickly become a large community concern rather than just a single one or two person concern. So working with our communications teams, we're able to effectively address those things quickly to help assuage some of those community concerns, let people know that we're engaged, we're aware of it, and what we're doing in steps to provide that safety for the campus for that day. 
And of course, our facilities teams through our assessment outcomes and working with our, pro our projects moving forward, as well as identifying just daily and routine issues where there might be a safety issue with our actual building structures, our relationships couldn't be stronger. Outside, our law enforcement partners, you know, we couldn't do this job without them. Whether it be investigating threats to school safety, whether it be uh, working through behavioral threat assessments, or whether it be uh, addressing immediate crimes and safety concerns on campus, we work very well with both the Sacramento County Sheriff's Department as well as the Citrus Heights Police Department. And I mentioned behavioral threat assessments. While this is new into our district, I believe very strongly the majority of school violent acts can be prevented. Behavioral threat assessment is one of the key aspects to that. Through behavioral threat assessment, we're able to actually address observed or reported concerns, general concerns, those things where something's just not right. And, they want, and we can now have an opportunity to address it and examine it through a collaborative group of law enforcement, mental health professionals, social workers, school administrators, counselors, and safety specialists to look at the problem as a whole and find out where can we intervene? How can we provide services and resources to the student to help them become a more productive and integrated member of their school community and determine whether or not that student is actually on a pathway to violence? So I think that's a really important step that we move forward with. And that's the general overview of the program. I wanted to keep it brief for you tonight, but hopefully I can answer any questions you might have. If I can't, I'll do my best to get back to you. We know how to find you. We can do follow-ups. Thank you so much for the report. Questions, cool. comments, Mr. Hernandez. Mr. Jones, I just had a quick question. First of all, let me commend uh, your staff on the manner in which you guys handled that Dell Campbell scenarios and uh, right before we left on the break. I know that response was very, very fast. You guys went through the school and Speed, so I'm sorry, Mr. Speed. Hernandez, I don't think your mic is on. I have the portable one, so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there we go. Are we there? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Did you hear anything I said? I heard it all. Just want to make sure you two folks hear you. <laughs> well, it's okay. Anyway, I just want to thank you for the manner and how quick your staff responded to the scenarios that happened before you left for Christmas break. Here's my question, Mr. Jones. You mentioned that we work in a zone-type area. So are those specialist assigned to the same zone usually or do we rotate those zones and i ask that because i think you mentioned it's important to build a rapport mm -hmm. with those schools that we're zoning or, you know so i'm how do you do that how do you handle relationships that? are extremely important when it comes to safety it, and knowing the student body knowing the administrators knowing the staff is important so yes we try to maintain them in a specific zone and the reason we built it anchored by a high school and then it, it's probable feeder schools is so that, that safety specialists get to know that student really through the matriculation process. So hopefully they can get to know them in elementary school and continue those relationships and build on them in middle school and high school. So that there's a trusted person on campus. Again, not to be seen as a security guard or a law enforcement officer, because they're not, but to be seen as a trusted individual there for safety, someone they can actually approach and talk to comfortably. And how are they dressed like you? Exactly the way I look today. Thank you. I appreciate it. Mr. Amy. Thank you. Um, so a couple questions. Um, well, more of on a physical uh, design, environmental safety. Um, I think, and this is just a general comment, I think we always have to be careful when it comes to security, um, simply because there's a fine balance between people feeling that bars are keeping people out versus bars are keeping people in. Right. And if you make a campus feel too secure, it's almost like the people inside may start responding to the environment in which you've created. I know I work in community health centers. And for example, we don't have bulletproof glass because we found that when there was bulletproof glass, people responded and acted like they were a threat. So I do think that on campus security, we have to keep students safe, but we also have to make sure that we're not going overboard to the point that we're restricting their ability to learn in that environment. Um, the other question I have is just during non-school hours with the single point of egress, um, ingress and egress, I visited an elementary school. It was after uh, school hours. It was on a weekend. Um, and the entire campus was completely locked down from a perimeter perspective. So neighborhood kids could not play on playgrounds. They couldn't play in the basketball courts. They couldn't play in the fields. Um, I don't know if that's just kind of part of the new world with 
security? Um, or was that just an anomaly where people, you know, there were gates that were shut that shouldn't be? Um, but do we have a general philosophy on use of public facilities after hours? You know, to a large degree, I'll have to defer to my <laughs> partner, Frank Marta, uh, with respect to facilities use after hours. Um, formally, there is an actual uh, process to request permission to go for a formal event occurring on campuses. You know, I completely understand and actually agree with the aspect that our schools really are part of our community. They should feel that way. Um, and in so many of our sites, we actually have, you know, easements, so to speak, of where there's community use. And we don't want to, you know, really take that away to a large degree. But at the same time, we do have to balance those safety aspects of limiting intruder access during campuses and school sites. So that is something that weighs heavily on our minds as we process and move forward with these things. It's not an answer I can really provide mm -hmm. specifically today, but just know that there are many voices that are being, you know, heard in that same discussion. So if I could just add to that, um, there's not going to be a universal answer on every campus because a lot of it is specific to what that campus is experiencing. I would say the general philosophy is if we can be open, we want to be open to our community after school hours. But if we're experiencing acts of vandalism, if we've had other incidents within the community surrounding the campus, then you're going to see that we're going to take a more proactive approach to keeping that campus secure. And that's when you're going to see it locked down most, most likely. Thank you. Ms. Krefchek. What is a safe routes to school specialist? So the safe route to school specialist, she works on a grant right now specifically with 14 specific school sites within the district, um, really to address pedestrian and bicyclist safety. So they have uh, programs where she will come out and actually work with the site and provide programs uh, where they do walk events to, to a school. Um, they will do community bicycle events and bicycle education safety programs as well as address general safety concerns, working uh, traffic safety concerns, working with the County Department of Transportation uh, and Sitter Sites uh, as well to address specific issues uh, involving path, you know, safe pathways of travel for pedestrian and bicyclists around those school sites. Um, I guess this is just background knowledge, but do you, does that person or your department imp give input um, like for earlier, a gentleman discussed a school site. Um, when we're looking at new school sites, do you guys influence um, if the paths are safe for our students or which paths that they should take? Yeah, we do have a voice in those meetings and we do actually uh, offer some opinion and discussion within it. Uh, of course, there's so many avenues to address when we're talking about access, you know, uh, whether it be pedestrian, bicycle, vehicle, you know, towards the school site. Um, in sites like Creekside, there are challenges. But, you know, it's not a challenge that cannot be met. Okay, thank you. Um, so eight safety specialists for earlier, Mr. Kamadra um, said that it was 88 properties, 66 school sites, or maybe 64, 64. Uh, so what's your response time? I mean, do you think that that's um, enough for all of our schools? So remember, not being security, not being law enforcement, they're not considered first responders. So their goal is not to get there quickly. In other words, they don't have red lights and sirens on their vehicles to get there. Um, they're not going to be a first responder. But their zones are small enough to be available within a reasonable amount of time to address most safety concerns. But on the larger side, really, they're there to prepare the administration, prepare the educators to how to handle the majority of safety issues on a regular daily basis. <clears throat> so through preparation and planning, through training and drills, we're able to help that school site become safer and be ready prepared uh, for that incident. So that if something was to occur, they can address it and deal with it. The safety specialist can be en route and then help with assist with the larger you know, investigation or the other issues that may need to be addressed at that time. I liked that you highlighted that you had trained um, over 200 staff. Is that an ongoing thing? Do we continually train staff? That is staff? ongoing for right now. Yeah, yes. that's great. I mean, they're the ones that see the kids um, every day, every hour. And I know we've had instances where the teachers were the ones who really acted to keep kids safe. So I appreciate that. Um, in the safety assessment and vulnerability studies, you discussed external threats, uh, but what about internal? Most of the threats that we at least hear about, maybe not what happen most often, but are the internal, the student who brings a gun on campus or makes a bomb threat or something like that? How do you address that? So a lot of that is addressed through the actual behavioral threat assessment itself. <clears throat> that is focused specifically on those, safe, those student safety concerns. We have within the school district uh, an emergency notification system called Catapult. I'm not sure if you've been made aware of that yet. No. Catapult does a couple of different functions. Number one, it is a communication tool. 
where school sites can actually share information uh, with between their staff involving daily routine activities, whether it be reports of a suspicious person or perhaps a dangerous animal. They can is that, shoot. Uh, apologies, is that through email? Uh, it, it, staff, it is shared when they receive a notice, they can receive it both email as well as text information on their cell phone should they choose to input their personal uh, cell phone numbers. So they'll receive information that way. But through Catapult, uh, we can receive anonymous complaints as well as identified complaints or concerns from the community, as well as any member of our staff or other students. So people can submit tips simply saying, hey, I'm concerned about so-and-so, uh, or this person has expressed to me that something is happening and going on. So we can look into and address it. We can mitigate or kind of triage the initial report and determine whether or not we need to move on to an actual overall, you know, and more formal behavioral threat assessment. So yeah, we do look specifically at those internal complaints as well as the external threats as well. Okay. Um, oh, and then I really liked um, that one of the outcomes was improved signage and pathway marking. I think that's very smart. Great job. Thank you for the report. Mr. Miller. Thank you. Uh, Mike, um, I see we have kind of two paths where we're protecting people and training them and responses and uh, doing drills and such. And I did hear 200 staff. I know we have a lot more staff than that. Um, so that's just in the behavioral threat assessment. We, we were regularly training uh, and, and uh, providing presentation education in many areas. You, you uh, anticipated my question. Um, and I have a more, uh, I, I could see the, the how and why with our assessments and such, um, and not tonight. Um, I, I do have uh, PowerPoint fatigue, but where we're, I, I want to know where we're at with our fencing and gating, uh, with our uh, door locks, um, our access control, improved signage, where we're at and what it's going to take for this board to get to. And I won't say 100% because it's continual improvement and you're always assessing and, and looking for better ways to do things. But I want to know what it's going to take on, on a follow up, uh, either through a briefing or, or to the board. Um, very important to me that uh, uh, I don't want to look a, a parent or, or a camera in the uh, news camera in the face and try to explain why we didn't get to it in time. So I can't provide you where we're at today with the fence and gating. I can tell you that's a large project that really our facilities team is working to kind of, so to speak, eat that elephant from the tail forward. Sure. <laughs> uh, the, and that's the, what the scope of the project, the costs, uh, as well that's as moving forward with contracts and things like that. Very curious. Of those, four, yeah, of those four components, uh, signage, pathway marking, door locks are all sort of already in the process. Yeah, Combined good. not only from our upgrades and remodels of existing sites and new projects, construction, where it's been going on, but those are quick, low hanging fruits they're able to grab as they're moving around. The gating, the fencing, uh, those, are, that's another, like I said, project that's going to take some time. Superintendent Bassanelli, yes. I, it just as a reminder, we did uh, prioritize uh, $10 million of funds to go towards specifically facility um, implementation around the safety piece. Mm -hmm. So this has been something, so as Mike mentioned, we have been um, conducting the assessments and we are prioritizing where we're starting first in order to shore up fencing, locks, et cetera, explore even the potential for cameras. So there's there's a lot of pieces that are in motion. Um, we can provide uh, a board communication at another time related to the progress, just where we are Perfect. checking in on that progress. Perfect, that would help. Um, and then just another thought I had that I've seen at uh, other organizations, uh, uh, we, have, we have closed circuit television at every campus, mm -hmm. yet we do not have a, a center where they all go to. Um, and is and is monitored, and I don't know if that's a feasible idea or anything like that. But as far as you know, looking in real time at threat assessments it may be something that uh, the board might be interested in implementing. Ms. Costa. Okay. Yeah, in fact, you have camera systems. They're all, they're all Can you come to the mic just for the YouTube crowd? Sure. <laughs> I'll address the, the locks first. We have different generations of, of different styles of locks for the different uh, for different doors. Uh, there's uh, Mike has brought to our attention that the key lock system, the old Columbine lock, with the original first generation lock system, those are a lot of those are are still in our schools. We have push button locks. We have all types of different iterations of of locks. 
doors can be locked from the uh, interior of the classroom. It just depends on how the mechanism of it. So either it's a push button or it's a uh, panic hardware key or it is an actual key. We're gonna try to go to all push button locks at some point or another. Uh, all new schools get those and we're gonna try to continue on with the process and try to replace all those first generation style uh, uh, interior locking mechanisms. So that's on the door locks. On the camera systems, every school site has upgraded camera systems. They're all recordable. Uh, they, all, they all hold data um, uh, for a, a period of time. Uh, and they're all in, not only in the location to where the school site can access the data, it also goes to a central location, which is at the MNL yard. So all schools have upgraded camera systems. Okay, There's some schools that need additional upgrades uh, and different camera placements. And I think that's part of the threat assessment. Uh, that Mike will go ahead and let us know that there's particular areas uh, that are potentially vulnerable and we'll, and we'll uh, consider putting in uh, uh, more cameras uh, to be able to, to enhance. So we are monitoring in real time. We are, awesome. correct, yes. Thank you, Frank. Yeah. To your point, they're not monitored in real time. No. We can't go back and view them at any oh. point. So and really- To my point, I was talking about a real time solution. At this, at this point, they're not monitored in real time. Got it, yeah. Thank you. Ms. Costa. Mike, kudos. Well, kudos to safe schools all the time. I, as a former principal, safe schools was really something that I always valued and continue to value. I, about the assessment outcomes, and you may have said this already, you've completed the high schools, the middle schools, and the K-8s, and now you're starting on the elementaries. How long will it take to finish all of the elementaries? Our goal is to have them all completed by March 1st. March 1st, okay. That's the internal team goal. And will the board get a report back be happy at to do that, that point? Yes, be happy to do so. Thank you. Thank you for the report. I, a lot of what I was gonna say, my colleagues had mentioned, so I'll just mention a couple of things. I wanna reiterate for the public, something that you mentioned, um, we have really old campuses, really old campuses that need a lot of work all over the place, including safety, and it's a different time than when they were built. Um, I think the fencing is huge. I hear, I can't tell you how many times I've heard from families that there's just too many points of entry. Anyone can walk in at any time. Um, so I'm really excited about the fencing too. And um, I, I, my colleague, I hear you, you know, we don't want our campuses to feel like prisons, but um, safety has to come first. So I'm really happy that we are doing that. And from what I've seen where we have implemented the fencing, it's still welcoming and warm. Um, it doesn't feel like, um, like people are different, <laughs> which I think is very important. It's a campus, right? So appreciate that. Um, also, I appreciate you speaking about the the implementation and the training, because something I think about a lot is we have a lot of great policies, um, but how are we making sure that they're really being implemented throughout all of our campuses, especially when we know, you know, there's turnover, principals leave, staff leave, they go other places. So does that learning leave with them? So can you share a little bit about um, just the cycle of how often folks are being trained? Um, like, is that an annual thing or is it as people go leave? How, what, it's, how, what does that look like? I wish I could inform you today that every school site went through a regular scheduled training session. Uh, unfortunately, I can't do that. Um, you know, these last few years, especially with COVID, you know, our environment changed quite a bit. And the Safe Schools team, their direction also changed during that time. Hmm. Uh, they were heavily tasked with contact tracing and setting up COVID prevention plans with sites and working for education purposes in that area. So we are back and re-engaged in that staff training. Um, this year has been focused heavily on active threat, as well as the end of last year. And I do the majority of those trainings myself. Um, you know, I've completed those at most all sites now. I think there's less than a handful of sites that I have not touched uh, with respect to that training. Um, our drills, we have safety specialists that participate in all drills. Drills are mandated by the state, the frequency. Fire drills monthly at elementary schools, twice a year at, at secondary schools and such. Lockdown drills, you know, once a semester. Uh, you know, so shelter in place, you know, drills that they choose to do those earthquake drills. We have safety specialists participate, monitor, and really direct those drills um, at each occurrence so that we can ensure, again, that compliance, that consistency, you know, throughout the district. Um, we are working to develop, you know, and kind of establish, let's say, you know, a regular and routine um, retraining for new staff onboarding, as well as that, how often do we go through and update such as after threat training? You know, is that an annual thing? Is it biannual? 
Um, I'm not certain of that yet. Those are conversations we're still having, but we're working towards that goal. I appreciate that. And just having the conversation is a lot. Um, so I appreciate that that conversation is happening. And also, it's my understanding that some of the guidance has changed too. Like, what do you do when there's an act? And I'm not here to pretend I'm an expert. I'm not. Um, I don't know what is the right way. You know, um, I trust you to like, make sure that we're safe. Uh, but it is my understanding things change as we gain more knowledge. So um, I would love to know as those conversations continue to happen, um, if there are changes or um, how do we roll out, you know, just making sure everyone knows what to do um, should, should they need to. And the last thought was on partnerships. And so I'm, I really appreciate our safe schools model. I think that this is a, this is a community based program for safety in our schools that's welcoming um, and good for students. Um, and so I wonder about the partnerships. Um, you talked about the partnerships with law enforcement. I'm wondering, do you, uh, there seems to be some good recommendations coming out from Moms Demand Action and Sandy Hook Promise. Just wondering, do you partner with those groups or look at their recommendations and see about, you know, does it make sense to implement in our district? Yes, we do little recommendations specifically from the Sandy Hook Promise, as well as, you know, through the Department of Justice, through Homeland Security, through the Secret Service, for all the safe school initiatives that come out. Um, those kind of really are the foundation for our best practices. Um, when we come to community partnerships, we go to our parent-teacher organizations and meetings we attend, and we listen with those. We participate within site safety committees, hmm. um, which includes both staff, administration, as well as parent uh, representatives. We also participate quite a bit with our student groups uh, through um, the student government, as well as other uh, on-site student campus groups, especially, especially at the high school level. Uh, we get some input and feedback. So we do try to incorporate as many voices and as much opinion as possible. One thing I am very proud of with the program is even though I still consider this program in its infancy, it has already been served, or I should say served as a model for other nearby districts, including Folsom, Cordova Unified, Natomas, um, as well as uh, that I know of, I've participated in assisting and setting up within Carmel Valley and other districts outside as well, so. That's wonderful. I wrote something down when you were talking. I, I, I feel bad that I didn't say this before, and I'm so glad that you just brought it up, that you're talking directly to students. They're the ones that are there every day, and they know things that we would never know because they're it's their dream that they're living, right? So I really appreciate you mentioning in that you do, you know, connect with students on the safety planning. I think that's it. Any other comments, questions from the board, superintendent? Definitely. I think I just want to express my gratitude towards Mike and the Safe Schools team and Mr. Allen's leadership. This program has evolved over time um, to where it is today. And as I'm glad you mentioned, I was going to pop in and say it's been a model for other districts as something for to consider in terms of implementation. And when I think about the past couple of years, this team has had to rapidly evolve and respond to our situation um, from the pandemic to even current now with the uh, creative ways that threats are are handled um, where well, they're actually given made upon us. This team has been so responsive and supportive of our schools. I know our schools are super grateful for everything that you and your team do. And so I just wanted to say thank you publicly. This is, I saw the clapping happening and I just kind of wanted to clap too, because it's such an important, I mean, really, I mean, it's a big deal as a mom that takes their kid to school. You want to make sure you can pick them up. It's a big deal. So thank you for the report. Okay, we are on item I3, conveyance of a permanent easement on Hurley Way to the California American Water Company. Mr. Camarda. Thank you, President Creason, uh, board members, Superintendent Bassanelli, Ms. Cunningham. Uh, tonight's facilities item is an action item. Uh, the superintendent is recommending that the board call a public hearing to solicit public comment and adopt resolution number 4054, declaring the conveyance of a permanent easement on Hurley Way to the California American Water Company. I'm here to have uh, answer any questions uh, after you open up the public hearing. I declare the topic of conveying a permanent easement on Hurley Way to the California American Water Company, a public hearing, and it is now open for public comment. There are no comments. I declare the public hearing closed. Do any board members have questions or comments? Seeing none, this is an action item. Is there a motion to adopt resolution number 4054? <laughs> Mr. Hernandez moved. Any, somebody second? Do we have a second? Second. 
Seconded by Ms. Costa. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes 6-0. Thank you, board members. Uh, thank you, President Creason. Again, uh, this facilities item is an action item. Uh, it is the superintendent's recommendation uh, that the board call a public hearing to solicit public comment, adopt resolution number 4056, uh, declaring the conveyance of a permanent easement at Northridge Elementary School to the Fair Oaks uh, Water District. I declare the topic of conveying a permanent easement at Northridge Elementary School to the Fair Oaks Water District, a public hearing, and it is now open for public comment. There being no comments, I declare the public hearing closed. Do any board members have any questions or comments? This is an action item. Is there a motion to adopt resolution 4056? So moved. Moved by Mr. Miller. Second. Seconded by Mr. Avey. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes 6-0. Thank you. Thank you. We are on item I-5, <laughs> Williams Complaint Report. Mr. Allen. Good evening again. I am stepping in to present this item on behalf of Ms. Simlick, who is unable to attend tonight. Education Code Section 35186 requires that district staff report to the board at a regularly scheduled board meeting concerning any Williams type complaints and the resolution of those complaints that have been filed with the district. There were no Williams Act complaints filed the quarter October through December 2022. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Any questions or comments from the board? Thank you for your report. We are now at item I-6, annual policy review, Mr. Allen. And again, I'm presenting on behalf of Ms. Simlick tonight. In accordance to board bylaws and federal and state laws, the board is required to review certain board policies, policies annually to determine if they need to be updated and revised. Policies before you tonight have been reviewed by staff who has determined no revisions are necessary or recommended. Mm. Specifically, Ms. Stahlheber reviewed board policy 3430, investing in debt management, and Mr. Ginter reviewed board policy 5116.1, intradistrict open enrollment. Both were recently revised and approved by the board on February 15th, 2022. Amy Rove Gregory reviewed board policy 6020, parent involvement, and Ms. Schnepp and Ms. Kukral reviewed the co-curricular extracurricular policy. Both were recently revised and approved by the board on February 9th, 2021. These administrators are present this evening should you have any questions. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Do any board members have any questions or comments? Mr. Amy? I do, thank you. Um, so this is in regard to policy 6020, parents involvement. I don't have any recommendations for changes, but I do think it's important for us to focus in on the board policy and just remind all of us that it's the board policy to jointly develop and agree upon policy and strategies to meaningfully involve parents and guardians and family members in district and school activities at all grade levels advisory decision-making and advocacy roles and activities to support learning at school. And I don't think it's a bad idea for all of us to always think of how can we better involve parents in the decision-making process with as much intention as possible. Um, I look recently at the change to the LCAP pack, which switched from monthly meetings to quarterly meetings. That may have been very well justified, but I think anytime we're looking at less parent feedback in any way, we really need to understand why and how we're going to replace that feedback. Um, it's just something that's no secret that it's close to my heart, but I think it's important as we look at it tonight and recognize it is board policy, that that is what we've all agreed to do. So that's the end of my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. A.V. Any other questions or comments from the board? Okay. Thank you for the report. Thank you. Moving right along. Yep, I forgot it was next. Okay. We are at item J, board reports. Are there any board reports? Okay. And we are at item K, future. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry, Mr. Amy. No, 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 it's okay. Um, I just had two quick things. First off, um, I had some self-inflicted email issues over the past few <laughs> weeks. I downloaded it to the wrong app. So I apologize to anybody I didn't respond to in a timely manner. Um it, it was interesting, though, uh, part of that, I actually missed some notifications about a committee meeting that we had had. Um, and while it was all my fault, it did get me thinking about how we communicate to the community 
about public committee hearings that we have, um, when they're canceled, when they're held, um, and if there are ways to just better engage folks beyond an email distribution list. Um, again, I think the email distribution list, everybody was properly notified, but what happens to that one parent that may have been going to that meeting for a specific issue, but may not have noticed. So I just thought I would raise that. Um, and then I also just wanted to mention a um, number of us got emails about uh, Orange Vale Open and some trees on that campus. Um, I did want to thank uh, Mr. Camarda. Um, he is uh, going out to the campus on Friday uh, with an arborist to meet with those parents so we can look at it. We can really understand it together, ask questions, understand the situation. I look forward to attending. Um, but I think that's just a great way of hearing from the community, responding in a meaningfully way, and then hopefully involving them in the final decision-making process on what we do there, um, even though it's related to trees. Not exactly the, the focus of an academic institution, but very important nonetheless. I have to say the tree, the tree comments too, it's an interesting, the timing is very interesting. Um, and I would say too, and I agree, you know, your comments about committee meetings and making sure folks get the word out. I know Ms. Rye and Mr. Allen and others have um, recently made some changes to get the word out. So I highly, highly recommend um, talking, just very new changes because um, you may have some ideas that haven't been discussed yet and you may not know about the new changes. Any other board reports? Okay. Uh, we are at item K, future agenda. Do any board members wish to add any items to a future agenda? Seeing none, we do not need to return to closed session. We are adjourned. Good night, everyone. Thanks so much.